everyone. Welcome to my channel, Shakespeare Walkthrough, a close reading of Macbeth for better essays and class discussions. Um, my first video series will be on Macbeth. Hopefully I'll get some other ones done in time, but uh, hopefully, well, if you're here, you're obviously here for Macbeth, so here we go. Um, this first video will be very short. I'm just gonna walk you through very quickly through my, uh, my methods and approach. Um, and what I hope you will get out of the channel. Um, if you know exactly what you're looking for, then you can just skip forward to my other uh, videos and look for Act 1, Scene 5, or whatever that you need help with. So go, go, go if you need that. Um, but you might want to stick around because I've got a little reading guide at the end here. I've been teaching this for a long time, and of course I notice uh, that a lot of people hate Shakespeare, um, and the reason why they hate him is because it's uh, the language is so is, is tricky, and it's tricky for several reasons. One, it's it's elevated in many ways. Mostly, of course, it's because it's old. So what I've done is I've compiled a list of the of of the problems that I find students have, and myself. These are the same kind of problems that I have as well. So I'm going to walk you through these as well, and I think you'll find them useful. Okay, so let me just read you through this, and then I'll. I'll digress a bit and, um, and fill you in on, on some of the things that are included here. Okay, so hi everyone, welcome to Shakespeare Walkthrough. If you're familiar with video game walkthroughs, you'll understand what I hope to achieve with this channel. Yes, I am a video gamer, so that's where I got the idea for this channel, because I've watched many, many a video game walkthrough. Uh, think of it as a completionist's guide. An old pro will take you step by step through the twists and turns of the play, and in the end, you'll have a comprehensive and detailed understanding of all its dark secrets. Uh, I've done this with students before. I've worked as a tutor as well, and I've worked one on one, and we've we've watched a play, and we've we've looked at the text, we've watched the video clips, we stop, we pause, and we go through the the, the important stuff line by line. The the non important stuff we kind of gloss over, as you'll see here. But I've seen it work with students. I've worked with them for over a couple of months actually, scene by scene, line by line. And by the time they're finished with the, by the time we are finished with the play, they know it inside and out. They they they've got all of the the thematic stuff down they know the plot progressions point a to point b and they know how to uh to answer questions on tests and exams and of course write essays so it, it's it, i find it's really useful um by seeing analysis in action you'll not only increase your english grade but you'll also be able to apply the skills you learn here to other works of literature film and art generally in short you'll be smarter well that's the goal um as i said like working side by side we'll, we'll see a line and we'll stop and we'll say you know what that that's there's something more to that and I remember when I was a student I always knew that there was something more to these lines but I didn't know what they were so I'm gonna walk you through those and the more you do it with me the better you get at it in on your own uh, here's my method I'm going to read the entire text with you uh, not all of it actually we will gloss over some parts of it but I'll make sure you understand the plot who's doing what and why yes that is important teachers want to know that you have to know that when we reach the important stuff, we'll slow down and I'll guide you through the literary aspects of the work, the stuff your teachers will be looking for in their class discussions and essay assignments. So uh, it's a cheat sheet. Um, you'll, 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 get, you'll get the pointers. You'll, you'll know what's going on in the important scenes. You'll know what's important to talk about and you'll impress your teachers. Um, I'll include a timestamp for the important sections as much as I can uh, so that can help guide you through the, uh, through the process. My approach, there are many ways we can look at a text, many critical lenses we can use to understand it. If you're interested in history, for example, you can examine the historical elements of a play. You can Google critical lenses if you want to know more about these approaches. There are other dozens of approaches. When I was in university, I learned them all. Uh, I liked some of them. I didn't like other ones. Um, I found some of them useless. I found some of them uh, really picky and um, not doing a service to the work. Uh, but that's all that stuff is up to you. What I'm going to do is the most fundamental reading of the play, which is what I'm going to talk about now. For this series, however, we will be doing a close reading of the text with a focus on theme and psychological development of character. That's what I enjoy. So that's my particular critical lens. Um, but I think it's general enough for everyone to get something out of it. Um, close reading means we dig deeply into the text itself to discover as best we can the author's intentions. We will try to answer the question, what is Shakespeare trying to tell us about human nature and about the human condition? I do believe that this is the, this should be the focal point of any analysis of a film, of a poem, of a, of a whatever. The author does write with an intention. They do unless you deliberately set out to say this poem is about absolutely nothing and then you write it about nothing and fine that's an exercise in nothing but th th 
movies we watch go watch a movie and then ask yourself what are the what's the i don't want to talk about message or moral you know it's not a finger wagging this is the way we should be but the best literature does what shakespeare does is hold a mirror up to nature macbeth as you'll see as we walk through this he's showing us us he's showing us who we are and it's fascinating and so that's what i'm that's what i that's what i get at so hopefully um, you'll you'll get your good grades for school, but hopefully you'll you'll come away with something of Shakespeare's head in your head. Now, wouldn't that be amazing? One of the best ways to answer this question, I believe, is by asking another question. So analysis. Again, as a teacher, I'm trying to get students to go deeper into the text, and I and I got sick of asking the question, "What does that mean?" Well, what does that mean? And what does that mean? So I'm, I try to give the students a practical tool that can help them look at four lines of text and, 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 and pull something significant out of it on their own without teachers prompting them, asking them, you know, what does the apple symbolize? Or the apple symbolizes, you know, innocence, explain. You know, that, that's, leading, that's leading the student. And I, I don't want to lead you. I want this should be enough. If you start to, if you learn how to ask questions, then you don't need a teacher. All creation is a matter of choosing what to say, what not to say, and how to say it. In Act 1, Scene 5 of Macbeth, for example, look at what Lady Macbeth says. Uh, so they're getting ready to kill. Oh, by the way, you should read, you should watch a couple of movie versions of all of these plays before you get into my stuff, because my stuff goes into the nitty-gritty, and it would really help to know uh, the general arc of the story, just generally. Um, okay, so Lady Macbeth and Macbeth want to kill the good King Duncan. And they get news that he's coming to stay with them uh, this particular evening. So she's all happy. And she says, the raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Now, if we apply this strategy to analysis, you look at this stuff and say, why A, why not B? Why raven? Why not swan? Why horse? Why not, you know, sticky throat or something? I, I don't know. One of the things that drew my attention was this particular little tiny word, my battlements. Why does Shakespeare have Lady Macbeth say, welcome Duncan under my battlements? How would it have been different if she had said, welcome Duncan under our battlements? Now that's the kind of stuff that really reveals something about character. And that's how a great writer works. They don't throw it in your face and say, this is the way the person is. They just, they have them speak the way people do speak in real life so that it's accurate. Uh, I read an article years ago about, uh, uh, by a psychotherapist, and he did couples therapy. And he said that he, in the, in the essay, he said that he could tell within the first few hours of, uh, of, of sessions with, with a couple whether or not they're going to stay married or not. And he could tell that by their use of pronouns. If they sat there and they said, you know, I did this and I did that and I did this, then, you know, they knew, he knew that they were finished. Um, whereas if they said, you know, we did this and we think this and we believe this and we want this, then they think of themselves, the couple thinks of themselves obviously as an important uh, unit, a unit of two as opposed to a unit of one. So things like that, that's what I mean by close reading. That's close reading and it's, it's a really, really good skill to have. Obviously, Shakespeare's commenting on Lady Macbeth's own ambitions and on the corrupt nature of the marriage. Yes, it's a corrupt nature of the marriage. She sees herself as the center of it, and Macbeth is just a tool that she can use to get what she wants. Close reading is not a perfect instrument for discovering absolute truths, of course, but I believe it is the most fundamental and satisfying approach to literature, if for no other reason than it honors our very best writers and thinkers. They have something important to tell us about who we are, and we'd be foolish not to learn from them. I, if you don't believe this then I don't know why you're here. We read literature because we, we put some trust in these great writers to tell us something important. And so that's why, that's why I'm here, because I think Shakespeare is, is one of those guys. He's not the only guy, but he's, he's one of those guys who's got something to tell us. Um, okay, so sources you can read through that. I'm going to try to put these PDFs, by the way, up on my website or the YouTube channel somehow. So hopefully you'll be able to download these. But it's um, my I, I took it from Open Source Shakespeare. You can find it on the internet as well. Uh, okay, so let me go through this uh, reading fairly quickly. Uh, like I said, it, it's I call it rocks and dirt because these are the things that irritate students about Shakespeare. And so I use this analogy. You're Indiana Jones, you're an archaeologist, and you're at the top of... You're in the, in the desert, and you're on the top of the 
land and you know that there's treasure underneath there and the treasure is of course the meaning of the text deeply felt and truly understood and not just you know an a plus on an essay somewhere but you know it, hopefully when you hit the best of Shakespeare and if I can help you get there you'll know what I mean by this it's like you get there and it's like wow wow that was amazing that that's what what I just read on that page is something that I've seen and felt in my own life and it's it can be a really profound experience so hopefully that's where where, where we will get but there's all of these rocks and dirt between Indiana Jones and his treasure at the bottom. And so you got to dig through them. And it's a real hassle. And that's why people usually give up. They just don't bother because it's easier to watch a movie. Fair enough. There's lots of amazing movies that do exactly what Shakespeare's doing here. But Shakespeare adds another component to it. Um, okay, uh, so let me go through these. The first one I encounter is pronouns. Pronouns are abstract and therefore deadly. You can't close your eyes and see an it or a she or a him. You can't see them. They're completely abstract. And so what I find is, is that when I'm reading a difficult text or a difficult poem or a long soliloquy or something, it's like I understand what's going on and then the doorbell rings and I try to forget it, but then I lose track and then the meaning just disappears. It's almost like you're trying to pick up a handful of water and you've got it for a few seconds and then it just disappears miraculously out of your hands and so that's what happens to meaning too one of the ways you can avoid that is by uh, making sure you locate the solid noun for the ad for the for the pronoun so jimmy bought a banana sally ate it what's the it is the banana of course it's simple but look how confusing it can get in a, in in shakespeare it can get very confusing indeed and if you're not always pointing out who this his is then you can get lost very easily. So Macbeth is getting ready to go murder um, Duncan, uh, and he's starting to have a panic attack, and he's hallucinating, seeing all these weird things. And so, for example, witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder. Now, murder's the key noun. Murder's that banana here, and the murder's going to be doing something. Alarmed by murder sentinel, the wolf, the wolf's howl, this is weird. He, the wolf howls his own watch. The wolf is the watch of murder. Now, murder is personified here, obviously, so that adds a layer of complication. Thus, thus with his stealthy pace, whose stealthy pace? Is it the wolf or is it the murder? I think it's murder. Murder's stealthy pace with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design moves like a ghost. So murder is moving like a ghost towards his own design. So murder's design. Do, do you see what I mean? So, yeah, Find the bananas, and, and, and it'll help you make sense of, of things like that, of, of a mess like that. That can be a real mess. When I first read something like that in a play that I haven't read in many years, I've got to go back and read it a few times. Um, similar to pronouns, uh, that picking up the water thing uh, shifts. Uh, I, know you've, I know you've read complicated novels, and you've, you're in Paris on one page, and you turn the page, and all of a sudden you're in Saskatchewan or something like that, and, and you wonder how the hell I got there. Uh, very often it's because you missed a shift. Uh, they've shifted in place or they've shifted in time. Oh, flashbacks can be nasty shifts, a shift from one thought to another. Uh, 20th century literature does this a lot, and it can be really tricky. Uh, stream of consciousness, writing, for example. But in Shakespeare's soliloquies, they can be nasty. Macbeth actually is not so bad in this regard, I found. Uh, Hamlet is a nightmare for this. Uh, you've, you've got these really long speeches, and you've got to really say, okay, he's talking about A here, now he's finished A, now he's talking about B, now he's finished B, now he's talking about C. you got to follow him. Here's a, here's a little example that's not, not too bad, but again, Macbeth is going, uh, going to kill Duncan. He's going crazy. He's hallucinating and seeing a dagger in front of him. And he says to himself, I see thee still and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. So he's kind of crazy here. He sees, this is when he first starts to see this, this uh, blade hallucinating. But then he shakes it off and says, there's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. So he's not crazy here. He says, no, God, I'm just, I'm just kind of stressed out. That's all. So he's got his rational faculties about him again. Now, or the one half world, nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. So now he's actually really crazy. So he's slipping out of it again. So he's slipping in and out of these um, uh, states of, 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 of uh, sanity, I suppose. Okay, so watch out for that. Uh, Sally, a burger eight. Uh, this is a cute one. I like this one. And it's relatively easy once you see it. You're probably already somewhat aware of it. English, by the way, is a subject, verb, object, language, if you didn't know. If you studied other languages like Asian languages or Japanese or something, then you know that uh, 
SOV, for example, is the Japanese way of doing things. I read a statistic somewhere where 23% of the world's languages are SOV, Salia Burger 8, and the rest of the languages are the SVO, subject, verb, object, Sally ate a burger. Now, English, of course, is Sally ate a burger. It's an SVO language, but Shakespeare, uh, older poetry and some modern poetry will flip these around. They'll say ate a burger Sally or Sally a burger ate because they need Sally to rhyme with alley or they need ate to rhyme with ate or something like that, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's quite, once you recognize that you're in this nightmare zone of weirdness, then you can kind of say, okay, wait a minute here. Where's the verb? Where's the action? And who's doing the action? And then you can place things, you can rearrange things to make sense. So here's an example. Whiles I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. So Macbeth is slapping himself and saying, come on, I got to stop talking and just go in and kill this guy. So here's the subject. Here's the Sally. Here's the eight, and here's the burger. So you just got to flip them around, and you'll see how easy it is. Words give cold breath to the heat of deeds. Now, I probably even I don't have to say anything else because you know what it means now, and all you did was flip around the, the, the words. So pay attention to that. Uh, punctuation is actually your friend. Uh, I've, I've had students say, okay, read the next sentence, please, and they read something like, I like. And then I tell them, okay, well, what does it mean? And they have no idea what it means because they didn't read the sentence. I see these still. Well, that's kind of obvious. Now or that one half world, for example, a student will stop at the end of a line thinking that that's a unit of meaning. But the end of a line is not a unit of meaning. That signals the end of the unit of meaning. That semicolon is the same as a period in most editions of Shakespeare. So that then you read to the end of that and it's crystal clear. You're lucky because Shakespeare's punctuation is pretty, or the, the punctuation that we use in Shakespeare today is the same as the what we use today. I like a pizza, but I don't eat it every day. Easy peasy. I like pizza, but I don't eat it every day. So that is a modern poetic rendering of something like that. So if you can start to see this mess like this, then things will make a lot more sense. Uh, this one, you can't escape from. Again, Shakespeare, uh, Macbeth is not too bad for this one. Other plays, oh, well, make, Romeo and Juliet are an, is a nightmare for this, an absolute nightmare. Romeo and Juliet has got a very flowery language. Uh, he's He was a younger poet when he was writing it, and he was showing off a bit. And there, it's about adolescents, and adolescents like to show off too, so, so there's a lot of that in Romeo and Juliet. Macbeth is not so bad. The language is a bit clearer, but as you'll see down here, as we've already seen, the language is, it, you do have to make sure you understand this concept. This concept is subject, junk, 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 verb, object. So for example, Jimmy, a new student in our class from Germany, a medium-sized country in Central Europe with the highest industrial output in all of other EU nation states, ate a burger. So this is a really stupid example, of course, but the, you have to know that the main sentence is Jimmy ate a burger, right? And once you got that, you're in the clear you can follow the logic of the soliloquy or the whatever and you, you can learn you mentally learn how to kind of just disregard this jimmy ate a burger you kind of mentally disregard it now the same thing is happening down here look at this murder moves like a ghost incredibly simple but i bet you the first time you read this it wasn't simple at all because you're looking for jim murder did what murder murdered somebody murdered you, you're looking for the subject verb object you're looking for the sally eats burgers you're looking for it and you can't find it so find the sally and find the eats and find the burgers and uh and it will make sense and learn to skip this stuff in the middle mentally skip it for logical purposes just so you can make sense of the sentence okay so that's number five number six uh, apostrophes, yeah. Um, Macbeth is full of these, and they're not they're not so hard. But I'm just going to draw your attention to them. Uh, an apostrophe is a literary device, and they're handy. It's handy to know that word for your teachers because your teachers love to have that on your essays and things like that. Oh man, this is a this is an apostrophe. Uh, an apostrophe is when you talk to someone that is not that can't hear you or talk to an inanimate thing or somebody who's dead. So if you talk to the moon, oh moon, you are most beautiful tonight. So I'm talking to the moon, which means I'm insane, which means I'm speaking in poetry. So Macbeth, for example, says, thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps. So he's gonna go murder Duncan and he talks to the ground and he says, ground, don't hear my footsteps because I don't want you to wake me up. I don't want you to wake anybody up. 
Um, so just be aware of those. It, it's, a, it's a layer of weirdness. Do you see what I'm saying? So you get that together with this, together with this, 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 this uh, these line breaks up here. So you get all those together, and that's what makes meaning difficult, not necessarily that by itself. Uh, another thing that can complicate things, and you've probably heard this before, are, are false friends. There's lots of vocabulary in Shakespeare that you just don't know because you don't know. Fair enough. Look them up. Uh, some of them you think you know, but you don't know. They're called false friends. If you studied a second language, a second European language, then you've, you're familiar with false friends, of course. Uh, for example, Shakespeare, when he says he wants a burger, it usually means he lacks a burger. I think it almost always means lacks. So you lack the, you want the human touch means you lack the human touch. Um, your habit is your clothing, not your routine. Bark, Shakespeare's always talking about barks, and it means a ship, because ship was made out of trees, so they call it a bark, uh, not the ex exclamation of a dog. So watch out for those, and YouTube, I mean, uh, internet filled with a bunch of funny little lists, and your teachers have probably given you cute little lists of, of Shakespearean words too, so fine. Uh, the last one's kind of cool, uh, the Zeitgeist. Uh, Zeit is a German word. Uh, Zeitgeist is a German word. Zeit means the times or the era, and Geist means ghost. And so I kind of extend this meaning a little bit. What 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 the original meaning is? Uh, it, it's it's the cultural soup that we're all swimming in. We all have stuff in our heads uh, that that we just have in our heads because we were born in this era, living in this time and place, place as well, because each country has their own Zeitgeisty stuff. But all countries on the earth come together and at this particular time and we all share a common zeitgeist as well as individual cultural zeitgeists as well um it's kind of it's kind of cool so for example one of our zeitgeists today you might be wondering why there's so many damn zombies in our video games and movies uh and it's because they are a personification of our sense of impending doom we have this sense of guilt and doom created by our understanding of climate change uh, that's popular in movies and, and everything else. Uh, and so we, we project those fears. Um, if, you, if you go back to the mid-20th uh, century, the, the, it was nuclear war. It was the Cold War that was in our zeitgeist. And so that, those fears crept into our film and, and, and books and things like that. Shakespeare's zeitgeist is very different, obviously. He's writing in England. Uh, and about 300, 400 years ago, and he had his own concerns. He didn't know what a cell phone was. Um, he knew what a ship was. Ships were a huge part of their zeitgeist. Uh, the age of, it was the age of exploration. Every month, something new and weird and freaky was coming back from Indonesia or Brazil, tomatoes and potatoes from Brazil. I mean, it was just, it was a really interesting time. So all of that feeling of excitement and newness and novelty makes its way into Shakespeare's works as well. Uh, for better and for worse. Um, yeah, okay, so you just kind of have to know that stuff. Um, that's partly why I'm here to, to help you walk through it and your teachers help you walk through it and things like that. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my introduction. Welcome to my channel.